as um, President Reif said and Professor Gong said, I, I do. Um, I, I do feel I'm sharing the stage with so many distinguished people. It is a bit like being on the Superbrain show, but I'm sorry to say there was no one here to put makeup on my face uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be able to describe some of the advances being made in technology, like the, uh, the ability to trace all the connections in the brain, like you see in this video of the mouse brain behind me and how it's enhancing our ability to understand both the normal brain and the brain in many serious brain disorders affecting millions of people. At MIT, we take a multidisciplinary approach to neuroscience. We start with the, the, the smallest processing elements, the neurons and all the molecular machinery inside of them, and then the collections of neurons into systems and the um, how these brain networks result in cognitive phenomena such as thoughts and emotions, and then we apply computational models to try to understand this incredible complexity. And our faculty members at MIT span all these different range, ranges. Now these faculty members include faculty members in brain and cognitive sciences, the biology department, the Pickhour Institute, McGovern Institute, and not only do they span all these, range, these levels of analyses, but many faculty members, as you can see, sit in the intersection of these different levels. And they help us bridge the levels so that we can understand, for example, how a mutation in a gene could result in an altered behavior and thoughts in an adult. And we also have very strong international ties, especially with China. Uh, the donors who established the McGovern Institute at MIT, Pat and Laurie McGovern, established three brain institutes here in, Be in Beijing, at Beida, Tsinghua, Beijing Normal University. And we have a major uh, collaboration with the, the Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technology in Shenzhen, which is part of the Chinese Academy of Science. It's one of our most productive uh, collaborations. And we've been helping our sister institutes also build up their faculty. And they now have a world-class faculty. And they also span all these different levels of analyses, taking a multidisciplinary approach. And we try to promote collaborations between MIT and, these, and our sister institutes. Uh, Yugo Shang, uh, uh, one of our donors, has donated funds to support a symposium that we have every year, either in, at MIT or in China. Uh, we have exchanges of students and faculty and so on. And this has resulted in collaborations that I'll tell you about uh, today. Now, as you might suspect, uh, brain research impacts many different levels of society, including artificial intelligence, education, and of course, health. And just to go through these briefly, uh, you're going to hear much more about MIT's work in uh, intelligence and artificial intelligence uh, later today. But I just want to point out that neuroscience is playing a very important role in this effort. It's part of the MIT intelligence quest, where neuroscience is both informing the models that are being used in artificial intelligence, and then those models are, in turn, helping us better understand how the brain works and processes information. And out of that interaction are coming engineering applications, commercial applications, and so on. We also have the Integrated Learning Initiative at MIT, and you'll be hearing more about that today, uh, where the idea is to take findings from neuroscience and help us develop new innovative educational approaches. And just uh, as one example from our, one of our faculty members, John Gabrielli, who's one of the directors of the Mightily Initiative, uh, John is studying dyslexia in children and is identifying the brain networks that are involved in dyslexia, the, the difficulty in reading. And he's now trying to identify these markers even before kids learn to read so that we can start reading interventions and get them a head start when they're in, when they're in grade school. We call this, this whole approach could be called in a way precision education, gearing the educational approach to the needs of each individual child. We also have a major collaboration with Beijing Normal University to test something that I thought many of you here probably have a belief about, but have never really been tested 
rigorously, which is that music education in young kids would result in cognitive benefits. But we felt this really needed essentially like a clinical trial where we would randomly assign kids to either uh, pian early uh, piano education in kindergarten, extra reading instruction. And that's often a very practical uh, decision the school districts must make, whether to concentrate in the arts or give kids more academic instruction. And we had a control group that did not receive either uh, advanced instruction, but at the end of the study, they were given either the piano training or the education. So all kids benefited from the intervention. And then we tested the kids before they had this intensive music or reading instruction. We did brain measurements on the kids to see how their brains changed. And what we found was that both the piano instruction and the extra reading instruction were both beneficial compared to nothing. Maybe that's not too surprising. Um, but that the piano instruction specifically enhanced the ability of kids not only to distinguish between sounds and music, but even the sounds in language. So they were better able to discriminate consonants, for example, and, and the tones in Mandarin, which I find impossible myself. Uh, but they were better at that, and we could show from their brain measurements that their brain's uh, processing of sounds had improved. And these are the building blocks of language. In fact, one of the approaches to dyslexia is giving kids hearing instruction to discriminate better between words. The next phase of this research would be to um, use some of these markers to identify which kids might benefit the most from, for example, music education in these early years versus kids who might benefit more from reading instructions and, and so on. Again, this is the precision education approach that you'll be hearing more about today. Now we turn to health where our approach is what many people are now calling precision medicine where you have to gear the therapy to each individual and not just applied broadly to groups. We know in the, in, the, in the area of psychiatric disorders that we give labels to broad categories of people, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, for example. But what modern genetics is telling us is that the genetic architecture of these disorders are different within the same label. So for example, within the category of autism, we now know that there are several distinct genetic abnormalities that lead to the vulnerability in autism. They have some shared characteristics, but the underlying disease process can be different, and we, and we anticipate that our therapy approach must be different as well. And fortunately, at the same time that we've acquired this knowledge, new technology has come on hand to um, manipulate the genome at a very fine level. And this is technology developed by Fang Zhang, one of the faculty members at MIT and the Broad Institute, who developed this CRISPR technology for genome editing that many of you may have heard about, in which you can edit the genome like you can edit the text with a word processing document. And this approach is being used both to develop new therapies, uh, as well to understand the disorders, and uh, will even be used in uh, gene therapy. For example, Feng Zhang has developed a system known as Repair, which targets the RNA, the expression of your DNA in cells in the adult person. And using this kind of approach, we could potentially correct the genetic defects in people even after they've been, um, even they, after they've been born and developed. Now, to develop um, these new treatments, we need better animal models. And Guoping Feng at MIT has been a leader in the development of new um, genetic models in primates. And the, the idea is that primates are much closer to humans, so that if we develop a therapy in primates, it's more likely to be successful when it's tried in humans than some of the therapies that have developed, been developed in mice, which have been far less successful. And we now have a major collaboration with the Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technology, as I mentioned, uh, we have, have a major paper that's now under review at a major journal, uh, and in which we report the development of, of macaques with a genetic form of autism. And we expect to start gene therapy in these animals later this year. 
not only are these CRISPR methods being used to develop new therapies for disease, but CRISPR-related technologies are also being used to both identify disease and, to, and identify mutations that could lead to disease. So Feng Zhang has developed a system known as Sherlock, uh, which is an extremely sensitive method for detecting tiny amounts of genetic material using a very inexpensive sensor, sort of like taking a, a pregnancy test. And this can be used out in the field in remote areas without access to expensive equipment and so on. And it can detect, uh, for example, a, a mutation that is leading to cancer. It could detect an infection like a Zika virus infection at a very early stage. And it could detect mutations that might lead to a later form of brain disorder. And this is now being brought into commercial development. So I, I want to end with saying that I hope I've shown you that these are big problems. They're going to take an international effort and the value of international collaboration. The experiment I told you about is the uh, primates with the genetic model of autism combined expertise across the, our two sets of institutions. At MIT, we had the expertise in CRISPR and the genome editing. And in China, we had world-class collaborators with expertise in in vitro fertilization in large animals and advanced MRI technology that was developed at SIAD. And putting together the expertise across the two countries and, and, and allowed us to do a study that would have been very difficult, if not impossible, otherwise. So uh, on that, I will end that, uh, on that note. And um, I will pass this on to our next speaker, Dr. Pan. <laughs>